Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com free site. DwyerVIP.com free site. Today is February the 10th, 2018. Now what I'm about to say is very important, especially as it pertains to this video because we're going to be making some picks in the video on things that the public disagrees with. So, listen to these words carefully. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, as of today, and odds change, right? Casinos get wise, gamblers get wise. Big whales come in and they change the lines. But right now, right after a Super Bowl, where the favorite lost outright, by the way, we cleaned up on that, right? Philly not only covered the spread, Philly won the game outright. Understand, sometimes the public is wrong. In that world, what I want you to consider is the idea that there are several high-profile fights coming down the pipeline this spring in boxing within the next few weeks that, quite frankly, might be mispriced. Understand you're watching a video where the person talking right now, me, thinks they're mispriced. So, let's talk about a few of them. Right now, Lucas Brown somehow, right, an undefeated former heavyweight champion, Lucas Brown somehow is a plus 225 underdog against Dylan White. Right now, look, I understand Dylan White is charismatic. I understand Dylan White is one of the best interviews in boxing. But Dylan White doesn't have Lucas Brown's footwork. He really doesn't. Dylan White's biggest win was a win over Derek Chisora. By contrast, Lucas Brown beat Rushlin Chagayev. Excellent fight. Had to get off the canvas to do it. Right? I feel this fight's mispriced. This is one of those fights where I believe the underdog wins the fight outright. This isn't even a value play for me. Right? If I saw this fight, and if it were even money, I would take Lucas Brown at this price, a plus 225. Now understand, these are the odds as of today, February the 10th. If you're watching this video in a few weeks, what you want to do, obviously, is check with your local casino and find out how much the odds have changed. I think Lucas Brown is a live underdog. I think Joseph Parker might be the best play on the board. I'm getting a plus 575? Who's he fighting? Lennox Lewis? Prime Mike Tyson? Joe Lewis? Rocky Marciano? Ali? No. He's fighting Anthony Joshua. Where do I sign up? Look, I'll be the huckleberry on the other side of the play for all you Joshua people. I know the public sees the visual. Joshua's a big, muscular guy who's taller than Joseph Parker. I know the public sees the personalities, right? Joseph Parker looks like he's a laid-back guy. Doesn't look like anything really phases him. You get the feeling that he might not fully appreciate the moment, right? But just understand, skill-wise, Anthony Joshua doesn't move as well as Joseph Parker. You know, Carlos Tackham fought both of them. Tackham had some interesting comments. He said that Joseph Parker is faster. <laughs> right? That's how we put it. He's faster than Anthony Joshua. Right? Tackham couldn't pick a winner between the two. He said Joshua is stronger than Joseph Parker, but you and I know. Strength only matters if the guy's able to find you in the ring. 
if the guy's actually able to land on you. How many rounds did it take Joshua to land on Klitschko? Let's just say Parker is much faster than Vladimir Klitschko. If Carlos Tackham fought both of them and doesn't know who's going to win the fight, and if the guy behind the counter at the casino is telling you you're getting a plus 575 on the Joseph Parker side, that's the side to be on. Here again, I personally expect Parker to win the fight outright. This isn't even a value play for me. Had these guys been, you know, at even money, I'd still be thinking about taking Joseph Parker. The casino's going to give me a plus 575. Sign me up. Now, as I said, this video is dangerous. You need to stop and think for yourself. I'm just telling you the value and the guys who I think are going to win in upcoming fights. The two guys I've named, Lucas Brown and Joseph Parker, I'm expecting to win the fight. This isn't even a situation where I think a guy is a 40% shot, but the casino is giving him no shot. So I'm thinking, gee, at these prices, let me let me just make a value play. That's not the case with these two fights. I'll be surprised if Dylan White or Anthony Joshua beats Lucas Brown or Joseph Parker. Let's name another fight like this, where I think the underdog wins outright. In other words, I heard the odds on the fight, and I was stunned. Right? I was stunned. Who set this line? The people who set the line on the Super Bowl? Jurgen Bramer. Plus 425? What am I missing? Was, was Jurgen Bramer in a car crash recently? Can, can somebody tell me what's going on here? Is, is Jurgen Bramer out with several women on the French Riviera not training for the fight? If you have inside information, please share it. Because I have no idea how Jurgen Bramer is a greater than 4-1 to one underdog against Callum Smith. Folks, I wouldn't make Jurgen Bramer a greater than 4-1 to one underdog against Joe Calzaghe. Who came up with these odds? Callum Smith. Who exactly has he beaten? Well, here again, I'm expecting the former light heavyweight champion to beat the young lion. I know Callum Smith is bigger than Jurgen Bramer. Guess what? Jurgen Bramer's made a career of fighting bigger guys. Bigger guys in a weight class higher than this. Right? Jurgen Bramer also is a technician. He's not relying on hand speed and foot speed. He's relying on angles. It's a different world. Technicians age better than athletes, right? So, also Callum Smith. How many Callum Smith fights have you seen where Callum Smith collapses the pocket, gets the guy up on the ropes, and destroys the guy? As I've said in a prior video, that's what Bramer wants him to do. Right? This is going to be like watching Foreman Ali, where Ali's hoping George Foreman comes in and tries to bum rush him. Right? So, here again, um, <laughs> you know, if you told me the fight was rated where Bramer was the favorite, I would have believed it. The fact that the casino is giving me better than 4-1 to one odds on Bramer as an underdog, that's absurd. I'm expecting here, again, the underdog to win the fight outright, I don't consider this a value play. Now let's talk about a fight that I do consider a value play. Then I'll get to Golovkin Canelo. Because there's a bet on the board there that I love. Right? Now this is a value play fight. In other words, if I had to give odds on the fight, I think the favorite, Devin Alexander, is going to win the fight. But wow, you're giving me a plus 250? On Victor Ortiz? A plus 250? You gotta be kidding me. I thought Devin Alexander and 
You need to research this for yourself. But I thought Devin Alexander talked about having an addiction to painkillers. I thought it reached a point where Devin actually started losing fights. And there was a little bit of tension between Devin and his trainer, Kevin Cunningham. Right? In other words, the fighter had slipped that much. Those close to the fighter who loved the fighter thought the fighter's addiction issue was actually affecting his in-ring performance. Now look, I do believe in second chances. Right? I've seen guys come back from, you know, a lot of problems, including addiction problems. Johnny Tapia, right, had addiction problems, came back, was marvelous in some fights. I've seen it happen. But wow, he's fighting a dangerous opponent with a big punch. Devin Alexander's in recovery. Would you want to be in recovery in against Victor Ortiz? Let me point out, too, that Ortiz is one of these guys who is fighting inverted. In other words, the angles are confusing. You don't know what dominant hand he has. Right now, the guys who give him problems are guys who set traps and have punches like Luis Colazzo. I think it's an open question on whether Devin Alexander has the kind of artillery to stop Ortiz cold. Understand, Ortiz has gotten up off the canvas against big hitters like an Andre Berto, like a Marcus Maidana. In other words, he's been in the ring with big hitters. Right? So, in a fight where I'm not sure if Devin Alexander is where he once was because of some personal demons he's recovering from. Against a guy who, granted, isn't the boxer Devin Alexander is, but wow, he hits hard with both hands. I like Victor Ortiz at plus 250. This is a value play. In other words, I won't be surprised if Ortiz loses the fight. But if I'm going to bet 10 bucks to make $25 in profit plus the return of my 10 bucks at a plus 250, I'll be your Huckleberry. I'll take Victor Ortiz. Right? I think that fight's mispriced. Now let's talk about a mispricing in the Saul Alvarez Golovkin fight. Now, first, let me say this in all candor, and I know many in the crowd disagree with me. The first fight was ruled a draw. I thought that was ridiculous. Right? Let me just say, too, that I don't go by official scores. I go by what my two eyes tell me. And so, I saw a fight that Golovkin won. I don't think they were beaming some different fight into my TV. I saw a fight where Canelo, one of boxing's hardest punchers pound for pound, had to abandon the pocket in the middle of the fight. Literally had to abandon the pocket in the middle of the fight and was hustling around the ring while he was getting hunted down. Right? I thought it was clear that Canelo had more to worry about in that fight than Golovkin did. I thought it was clear that Golovkin was not afraid of Canelo's power. Right Now, I do think Canelo has a hard punch, but let's just say Golovkin looked far more confused to me in the Danny Jacobs fight than he did the Canelo fight. So, to me, this fight's mispriced. This isn't even the bet I like. I think Golovkin should be greater than a plus, excuse me, than a minus 180 favorite. Right? Canelo is going to have to fundamentally change the dynamic of the fight to have a chance here. And I don't think he can. Right? Simply put, Canelo, who hits hard, who, in my opinion, has the faster hands, has the better combinations, right? Is actually better in an exchange up close, deep in the pocket. Is facing a guy in Golovkin, and I know Golovkin's older, who's the better athlete, 
who, and I believe this is important, is the more unorthodox, harder to read fighter. Right? Golovkin comes in, he's throwing bombs from distance, the punches have a little bit of a curve. You'll notice fighters don't quite know where the punch is going to land. Right? Golovkin is a master at spacing. In my opinion, that's extremely hard to duplicate in sparring. I also feel that when fighters get hurt in fights, they revert back to what they know. So if Canelo gets really rung up in the fight, he's going to start to think that he's fighting a normal fighter. But he's not. He's fighting a guy who, you know, can knock you out with shots on the top of the head like Golovkin did against Marco Antonio Rubio, right? He's fighting a guy who, you know, can wind up and you don't know where the punch is going, right? Let me also point out, too, that Golovkin obviously is the better long-range puncher. In other words, Canelo is giving you all kind of problems in the pocket. Golovkin, who has ring coverage, doesn't have to be in the pocket. He can be outside of the pocket and hurt you with long shots. Look at the Martin Murray fight, right? Let me just say, too, Golovkin has better stamina. Now, I know, I know people are going to say, you got to be kidding, Dwyer. I thought Canelo made a comeback late in their first fight. I thought Golovkin was the one who looked like his tank was running a little bit low. Right? Well, all I can say is understand up until that point, Golovkin's making the fight happen. He's the one on his front foot. He's the one who has Canelo on the defensive. Now, I believe Golovkin can make a simple adjustment. It's a simple adjustment that'll make this fight much easier for him. Right? That adjustment is to, and I know this sounds counterintuitive, it's to get Canelo to come find him at times. In other words, let's go back to Foreman Ali, the rumble in the jungle. Rather than have Ali up on the ropes, rope-a-doping, wouldn't it have been something if Foreman would have stopped throwing punches in, let's say, the third round and would have taken a step back and would have said, hey, I'm here. You know, come get me. Rather than watch a guy move away and be defensive and back up and go from ring post to ring post. I believe all Golovkin has to do is to take his foot off the gas a little bit. He's not fighting Kel Brook here. He's not fighting a guy who moves that well, who he has to corner to find. No, he's fighting Saul Alvarez, who he knows where he can find him. Right? Guys aren't looking for Saul Alvarez. No, you know Saul Alvarez is right here. So, I believe if Golovkin, who has the better long-range power, just makes this a long-range fight, right? Takes a step back. Operates from a distance where only he can throw great power shots. I know some of you are going to say, didn't Canelo hit? Austin Trout knock him down from halfway across the ring. Folks are going to say, hey, didn't he stop Amir Khan from some distance? All I'm saying is if I'm Golovkin, who, let's face it, hits much harder than both of those guys, right? Invite him to try that here. You want Canelo to try to open up where he has to extend himself. Force Canelo to take the lead a little bit. Let me also point out from the Canelo side. Canelo, as I've said for years here online, is really one of boxing's hardest punchers. That's his calling card. He's done certain things since the Floyd Mayweather fight. He somehow increased his hand speed. I applaud him on that. But he's really a guy who takes you out with punching power. Now, in his interviews, Canelo feels that he left the first fight on the table. 
right? Canelo is vowing to increase his intensity here. He wants to land more punches. He wants to be more aggressive. I believe Canelo wants the stoppage. So, that brings me to the bet I like. Because I don't believe Canelo in a firefight has the stamina to go 12 rounds, and we're talking about a firefight. I'm not talking about a fight where Eris Landy Lara is running away from Canelo. By the way, I still think Lara won that fight. But we're talking about a fight where you have heavy artillery coming back at Canelo. Where Canelo understands he actually has to take a step forward and engage his opponent. Not just move away and, you know, stay on his horse in the middle rounds. I don't believe Canelo, if Golovkin fights the right fight, right, has a cushion between him and Canelo, but forces Canelo to engage. I don't believe Canelo has the stamina to go 12 rounds against Golovkin in that fight. I think Golovkin fought the wrong fight the first fight and still won the fight. Right? They called it a draw. Okay, whatever. Right? The judges can bet the second fight how they want to. I'm just telling you, I saw Golovkin win the first fight. Right? Golovkin fought that first fight like he fought the Kell Brook fight. He's, he's hunting down Saul Alvarez, right? After the a first two tentative rounds, Golovkin puts on the Jets and he's cutting off the ring and he's giving Canelo no breathing room. Right? Because Golovkin is the one with the better long-range power and because Canelo, in my opinion, will have problems at long range, trading with Golovkin. If Golovkin's more patient, if he's not constantly collapsing the pocket. By the way, let me just say, the same advice goes to Sean Porter, right? If Golovkin just has a little bit more back foot, in other words, he goes over to Canelo who starts moving away immediately. Isn't that the fourth, fifth, sixth round of the first fight? Right? Canelo's here. Canelo's moving away. Right? Rather than hunt Canelo, what about if Golovkin just motions to Canelo? I'm telling you, folks, that's powerful stuff with the crowd. Right? People pay money to see a fight. The judges are going to ask themselves, gee, who's the person avoiding the fight? It's not like Canelo circling Golovkin and popping a jab. This isn't Ali. This isn't Salvador Sanchez. No, Canelo is moving away from the pocket altogether. He's going from ring post to ring post. When he does that, shouldn't Golovkin slow down a little bit? Shouldn't Golovkin motion to him, say, hey, I'm over here. Come fight me. Right? Wouldn't George Foreman have beaten Ali if Foreman in the third round would have just stopped and said, Muhammad, I'm the one wearing the belt going into this fight. I'm not going to punch myself out. You're going to have to take your 30-odd-year-old behind off the ropes, come meet me in the middle of the ring, and trade a little bit if we're going to put on a show for the people. Otherwise, I'm just going to watch you up on the ropes and I'm just going to take my time, go over there, land two or three punches at the end of the round, and dare these judges to take my title in a fight where my opponent has been inactive or has been fleeing the pocket. So the bet I like here, because I see a stoppage, either Canelo ups the game, he's the younger man, finds Golovkin and stops him, for the first time in Golovkin's career. Or, as I suspect, Golovkin's a little bit cagier, forces Canelo to spend a little bit more energy than he did in the first fight, and then takes him out. Understand, this fight, figuratively speaking, is going to start in the 13th round. These guys have already seen each other for 12 rounds. 
I believe Canelo is a guy who is so obsessed with legacy. It's one of his best traits that it literally forces him to fight the Floyd Mayweathers, the Arislandi Laras, the Miguel Cotos, the Gennady Golovkins. Right? I believe in boxing, you have a lot of yes men around some of these superstars. Who in Canelo's corner is going to tell him, player, we don't want to fight Golovkin again? Right? I'm guessing there were guys in the corner listening to the scoring who were thinking, oh man, you know, we, we might lose this. Then they heard they got the draw at the end of the first fight and they thought to themselves, I don't need to see Triple G again in my life. We fought him. The critics can't say we dodged him. We survived this. Let's move on, right? Isn't that the strategy the Canelo people took after the first Arislandi Lara fight, which turned out to be the only Arislandi Lara fight? Now, I think what's going on here, because Canelo has good people around him. He has Oscar De La Hoya, who knows boxing, around him. I believe this is a situation where Canelo is driven. He wants to be the very best. Who's going to tell him he's not Marvin Hagler? Right? Who's going to tell him he's not Carlos Monzon? So Canelo, after the first fight, and I'm sure this is in the locker room when guys are like, thank God we got by that fight. No more Triple G for us. I'm sure Canelo's saying, I need a rematch, man. This doesn't feel right. You know what probably happened. He probably turned to the guys around him and said, who do you think won that fight? And you know these guys are thinking about their kids' private school education. That mortgage bill that's coming up at the beginning of next month. They're looking at Canelo and they see the guy who pays them. So you know the way that conversation went. Canelo turned and said, who do you think won that fight? Wherever he's talking to, he said, Canelo, you did, boss. Right, so then Canelo probably said to Oscar De La Hoya, you know, De La Hoya said, hey, I got all these great people for you to fight. Canelo said, no, no, I want the rematch here. Folks, they don't even know where the rematch is taking place. They just know it's May the 5th. To me, this is a fighter who wants to be great, who feels it's his time. Maybe he's right. Who said, look, man, draws aren't for me. I want to prove it in the rematch. And I salute him. I don't believe he's showing up to the rematch trying to get a decision. I think he wants a stoppage. The bet I like here, and I'm shocked it's priced this way, is the under 11 and a half rounds. Folks, over-unders don't get higher than that. It's the under 11 and a half rounds, and believe it or not, the casino is giving you better than even money odds. A plus 130, right? Today is February the 10th, 2018. The casino is giving you a plus 130. So you don't even have to know who wins the fight. If you're watching the fight and Canelo lands and suddenly Golovkin's in trouble and hits the canvas, you're thinking to yourself, man, I didn't see that coming. But then you're also thinking, whoa, we're not even in the 11th round yet. Where's my betting ticket? I have to go by this casino tomorrow to cash it. If, as I suspect, Golovkin comes in, understand. Guys usually don't go the distance against Golovkin. The 11.5 to me isn't historically based here. Okay, Danny Jacobs, after getting dropped, gets up, makes it to the distance against Golovkin. Right? Looks completely spent at the end of the fight. Then Canelo, after hopping on his bike and literally moving away from Glovkin for several rounds, makes it to the end of that fight. By the way, look at Canelo at the end of the fight. He's spent, folks. Other than that, you have to go back several years. Think about it, years to find a guy who went the distance with Golovkin. Right. Guys don't go the distance with Golovkin. And you're telling me that the casino 
is giving me an over-under of 11 and a half rounds? And they're giving me better than even money odds? This is so ridiculous, you almost want to pick up the betting slip and say, hey, but, you know, let me read the fine print. This, this seems odd to me. So, if you, like me, believe that this fight ends in stoppage, in fact, if you believe Golovkin wins it by KO, don't take the minus 180 on Golovkin to win. Take the under 11 and a half rounds. To me, that's almost a hedged position, right? Because then if Canelo lands on Golovkin and gets a stoppage, you collect on that as well as long as it happens before the midway point of the 12th round, right? 11 and a half is 11 full rounds and half of the next round. So I like the under 11 and a half at a plus 130. Right now, if the line changes, obviously the analysis is going to change. The odds matter here. But today, the casino is offering this bet. My attitude is, hey, why wait? Let me get a position here. I like the price. I like the under 11 and a half rounds at plus 130. Let me sum up the bets I like here. Right? And this really is an underdog special, but understand, I believe that betting on underdogs is where you make most of your money, right? I also believe that when you like a favorite, like a Golovkin here, you have to be creative and you want to take the bet, you want to structure the bet, so that you win if the favorite wins like you think he will, and you're also covered if the underdog gets lucky, right? So, the bets I like. Lucas Brown plus 225 against Dylan White. <laughs> One wonders when Dylan White held a share of the heavyweight title like Lucas Brown did, but okay, whatever. Uh, Joseph Parker plus 575 over Anthony Joshua. I know the Joshua people think I'm picking on Joshua. Look, this is gambling. I'm just trying to profit off the fight, right? Let me also point out, too. If you lock in Joseph Parker at plus 575, <laughs> think about that, right? B bigger than 5 to 1 underdog. Then you actually have room to fool around with Joshua by KO on the other side of the play, right? Because understand, you have the Parker side. Whether Parker wins by decision or by stoppage, at huge odds. So you have leverage to play around on the other side. I like Joseph Parker, plus 575 over Anthony Joshua. I like Jurgen Bramer, plus 425 over Callum Smith. <laughs> right Here again, someone's going to have to tell me how the public is discounting Bramer's career to this extent. Folks, even the fight he lost to Nathan Cleverly, he's winning that fight before an injury. Right? Understand here again, you can get the underdog at such great odds, plus 425, that you have leverage to play with. So if you're afraid that Bramer, who is older, who did have a fight, stopped by injury, is going to tweak a ligament or tweak a tendon and have to call it a day regardless of how the fight's actually going, then you can hedge the play with Callum Smith by KO. Finally, I don't know about you, you know, I've had friends who've been in recovery, right? If any of those friends then told me, hey, I'm fighting Victor Ortiz, and then the odds maker told me I'm getting a plus 250 on Victor Ortiz, I'd have to say to that friend, player, I'm rooting for you spiritually, but I'm going to have some money on Ortiz at plus 250, right? That's, that's a simple value play, right? Bet $10 to win... $25. That's how I see it. And of course, Glovkin, Canelo, look, I don't have to be right to collect here. I think Glovkin's going to win. The way I'm playing it is the under 11 and a half rounds at a plus 130. Right? You're talking about two of boxing's <laughs> biggest hitters. 
pound for pound. You're talking about in Golovkin a guy who normally doesn't allow guys to go the distance. Right? I like the under 11 and a half at a plus 130. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.